Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. We continue with Ask Me Anything this hour. Jimmy Aiken, our guest, your call is very welcome. 888-318-7884. You want to know anything about the Catholic Church, you want to talk about the faith, you want to talk about Jesus, the Bible, the sacraments, uh, you can call 888-318-7884. And as I have said before, when Jimmy's here, we have another category called whatever else you want to talk about. 888 888- 3187884 Jimmy Aiken is senior apologist here at Catholic Answers and when I say senior uh well past I can never remember the exact numbers but well past 30 years mm-hmm. I think actually senior person at Catholic Answers I say senior apologist all yep. the time but there's nobody been here longer than you No I am currently the longest serving employee I've been here longer than anybody else uh, the, I, I know Jen likes to say she got here like two months after you or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, uh, she's the second longest. Oh, she is. Uh, but in addition to being senior apologist, uh, Jimmy also the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, one of the most popular documentary podcasts that you'll find anywhere on this planet. And, and it drops each Friday. What's dropping this Friday, Jimmy? We're uh, doing part two of our look at the new Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith norms or rules for investigating apparitions and other supernatural phenomena. So the document kind of has two parts. It's got a prefatory letter by Cardinal Fernandez, and we looked at that last week. And so this week we're looking at the norms themselves, and we're going to go through them one by one and talk about what they do and don't mean. And you were telling us last week this letter has already had an effect, like they're already – it's already moving things along. Yeah, w- one of the key goals was to enable behind the new norms was to enable the church to arrive at decisions sooner and in a more transparent way, and they've been doing that. Uh, in, this document was released like at the end of May, so two months ago, and they've already issued four rulings regarding different supernatural apparitions. Two of them got a thumbs up. Two of them got a thumbs down. You can find uh, hundreds of episodes of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. You can find part one already of this uh, two-parter, and then a new episode drops each Friday morning. Just go to mysterious.fm or just uh, look up Mysterious World on YouTube or just put uh, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World into your computer and it'll find it. Uh, Or you can call Jimmy right here and talk with him, 888-318-7884. I don't know why I said or. Those are not opposed things. And you can call. It's a a non-exclusive or. (laughs) Yeah, okay. There's two there's two kinds of ors. There's the exclusive or, which in logic is represented by sometimes by the by the characters X O R, and then there's the inclusive or, which is just O R. And so if I say um you can have apples or bananas, but not both, that's an exclusive or. But if I say you can have apples or bananas, and I mean or you can have apples and bananas, then that's an inclusive or. I, well, so, then I was definitely little, doing the inclusive or on that Little one. logic lesson for Psychelic today. I don't know any logic notation. I, that, that's like, that's, uh-huh. It's like a, it's a really like a mathematical language. Isn't it is, that, yeah. yeah. In, yeah. In, in fact, uh, when I took logic, I took both classical logic and symbolic logic in college. And when I took symbolic logic, you could get credit for philosophy you mm-hmm. could get credit for mathematics, or you could get credit for computer science by taking that wow. course. Uh, well, uh, 888-318-7884 is the number, but uh, every single line's full, so we're going to Bob in North Carolina, listening on our website, catholic.com. Welcome, Bob. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me on. Uh, this question might be pretty basic, but I guess since it's asking me anything, it's appropriate. Uh, this is regarding mm-hmm. the... Talk right into the phone, Bob. It's just, oh, I'm losing you a little bit. Uh, is this better? Better. Much. Never okay. use speakerphone when you're talking to a radio show. <laughs> Sorry about that. No um, problem. So this question's, this question's regarding the, a statement in the, in the Nicene Creed, um, mm-hmm. the statement about how Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. My question mm-hmm. is, what is the dead or who are the dead? Because my understanding is that when you die, you are immediately judged. So when Jesus mm-hmm. returns, who who are the dead? 
The dead are anybody that has does not have a functioning body at the time just before Christ returns. Um, the Catholic understanding of this is that when Jesus returns, those who are dead at that time will be raised to new life, either to a resurrection of eternal life or a resurrection of not eternal life, and they will then uh, receive judgment. This is what's known as the general judgment, and it's different than the particular judgment that occurs when we die. So there is a judgment that occurs when we die. It's known as the particular judgment, and we're assigned, we're judged at that point in spirit because we don't have our bodies with us. And then our basic fate is determined. We either go to heaven immediately, in which case we're glorified in spirit, or if we die in God's friendship but we're not pure enough for heaven yet, then we're freed of our disordered desires so that we can enjoy heaven and be fully united with God. Or if we fundamentally rejected God, then we will uh, suffer the consequences of choosing to live without God and the frustration that that entails. And so, but we'll only be suffering that in spirit because we don't have our bodies. And because this occurs um, when we die, the results of this judgment are not generally known. Certainly, they're not known to the living. You know, the living, unless God allows communication between the living and the dead, the living don't know what what, our, what your fate was when you had the particular judgment. The general judgment will be different in two respects. It will involve our bodies as well as our souls, so people will be glorified in body or not glorified in body as well as in spirit, and also it's going to be more public. Jesus says in the Gospels that what we've done uh, in secret will be proclaimed from the housetops, so there's an indication that this is going to be publicly known. That's not to say that necessarily every person knows what happens with every other person at the general judgment, although that could happen, but it will be more public. Uh, the phrase, living in the dead, is what's known as a merism. That's a literary trope where you use two opposing terms to compl to convey a sense of completion or wholeness. Like if you said, he searched high and low, you mean he searched everywhere. Or if you say, I worked day and night, you mean I worked like continuously. And in the same way, by saying that Jesus will judge the living and the dead, it's another way of saying Jesus is going to judge absolutely everybody. Okay, Bob? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, let's go to Chris in Canton, New York, uh, watching on YouTube. Uh, Chris, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hey, Cy. Hey, Jimmy. Um, big fan of this show. Big fan of Mysterious World. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you, Chris. Um, sure. Thank you. I, I came in. Think uh, I came into the church this uh, this Easter vigil. Praise so God. I'm Catholic. I. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I am. Uh, my question is, uh, how do I deal with, um, like, coworkers, especially, like, people who aren't close to me, who do ask about my conversion? They ask why, but um, very commonly, it doesn't seem like they, they necessarily care about, like, my personal story. They really, it, it does seem like they just want to, like, sort of argue me out of it. Hmm. Um, uh, uh very commonly, like I get, I, I watch the show, and I watch uh, a lot of other um, debates and things. So I am a little bit well well versed in some sort of uh, apologetics. But um, yeah, how, how do I deal with the, that sort of uh, that impersonal feel from from others um, after conversion when they when they want to spark up a conversation? Well, um, okay, so there's no obligation that you engage in conversation and you know if you're at work and you don't have time to engage in the conversation then you can say you know i'll be happy to tell you some other time but right now i need to focus on this task um if they're positively rude then you can say well i you know i'm afraid we'll have to agree to disagree on this but if neither of those is the case if you've got time and if they're being 
you know, at least basically respectful, even if they're a little impersonal, then you can share with them uh, either a capsule summary of why you became Catholic, or you can go into a little more detail. You said that they that some of these folks seem to want to argue you out of the Catholic Church, and so you can you can find out what their what their arguments are, and then respond to them. And if you don't know a response to them off the top of your head, then you can say, well, I'll, I'll do some checking on that and I'll get back to you. And then you can do that. But it's essentially a matter of prudential judgment, whether it's the right circumstances to engage in a conversation with someone. And if so, you want to gauge your response to what their interest level is. You don't want to dump way too much information on them, which, you know, can sometimes be a a risk for enthusiastic new converts. They may want to give more information than the person's actually interested in. Um, but it's essentially just trying to, you know, read the person that you're talking to and figure out how you can best serve them by positioning your answer so that it's the right length for what they're asking and that it addresses the topic that they're actually interested in. And so, you know, those are the general principles that would be employed in a situation like this. You mentioned that you've got some background in apologetics, and that's great um, because that'll make answering questions or objections a lot easier. Uh, Sai, since I've got that book, A Daily Defense, which has more than 300 defenses of the Catholic understanding of the Christian faith in it, why don't we see if we can send Chris a copy of that so he'll have uh, additional resources to use in conversation in a kind of concise way. All right, uh, Chris, all you have to do is hang on the line and give Edgar your phone, uh, no, your address, and we will send it off to you. A Daily Defense, 365 days plus one to becoming a better apologist. That brings us to the break. We'll be right back with more. Ask Me Anything with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Your questions, Catholic Answers Live. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. Have you ever been so grief stricken? You can't see God in the tragedy. You can't see God in that cross. You're enveloped in that grief. You're enveloped in fear. And God is out the window. You don't see him standing right next to you. Mother Angelica Live Classics. Tonight, 8 Eastern on EWTN Television and Radio. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken is our guest this hour, and it's an Ask Me Anything. You're welcome to call with your questions, 888-318-7884. Already putting Jimmy uh, to work. Two questions out of the way already before the first break, uh, and lots more to come because the lines are full at the moment. We're going to Tony in Texas watching on YouTube. Welcome, Tony. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hi, Sai. Uh, Jimmy, I'm a big fan of Catholic Answers and uh, Mysterious World. Awesome. And, um, yeah, a donor as well, so I encourage everybody mm-hmm. to, to, to donate to your organization. Thank I you, love Tony. It. So, yeah, my question is, what is the relationship between mortal sins of omission, good works, and salvation? So... Are uh, are mortal sins of omission a failure to do good works, and can we lose our salvation if we fail to do them? Okay, so a sin of omission, whether it's mortal or not, is a failure to do something. And since we're only obligated to do good things, we're never obligated to do evil things or neutral things, then uh, a a sin of omission is going to be a sin where you refrain from doing some good work that you could have done. Now, um, it is not obligatory in all situations that we do every good work we could possibly do. In fact, it would be impossible for us to do every good work that we could possibly do because we have situations in life where we need to make a choice between different goods. Um, So the only time that a a sin of omission, it's not even going to be a sin if you have to choose between different goods. There are 
options where you could choose one good or you could choose another good or you could choose something neutral. But if something is obligatory for you to do and you refuse to do it, then it is a sin of omission, not just an omission. And if that sin does grave damage, if it has, if it has, um, uh, if it has uh, grave matter involved, and if you do it knowingly and deliberately, you refuse to do it, then it would turn into a mortal sin. So, for example, uh, and that would cost you your salvation unless you repent. So, to give an example, one of the things that you're required to do as a good is if you're married, you're required to be faithful to your spouse. Fidelity is not just an absence of refraining from sleeping around on your spouse. It's actually a positive good in its own right. And so if you are not faithful to your spouse, that has grave matter. And if you say, I know this has grave matter and I'm I'm just, I don't care. I know it and I'm just going to do it deliberately anyway, then that would become a mortal sin of omission. To give another example that might be a little clearer, let's suppose that you're in a situation where where your spouse is about to die. Let's say they're about to be bit by a rattlesnake, and they'll die if they're bit by the rattlesnake. And you have the ability, without endangering yourself, to stop the rattlesnake from doing that. Let's say you got a bucket, and all you got to do is put the bucket over the rattlesnake and stop it from biting your spouse. Well, okay, stopping the rattlesnake is a good thing, and you're obligated to, you know, save the life of your spouse if you reasonably can. You know, you're not being asked to to put your own life at danger. And if you say, you know, I know I'm obligated to save the life of my spouse, but I just don't care. I'm going to let that rattlesnake bite. Then, well, you've omitted doing a good, so it's an omission, and you were obligated to do it, so it's a sin of omission, and you did it knowingly and deliberately, and it involves grave matter, so it would be a mortal sin of omission, and that would jeopardize your salvation unless you repent. All right, Tony. Sounds great. Great answer. Thanks a bunch. All right. Uh, thank no you problem. very much. Watch out for those rattlesnakes. Fabian's also in Texas watching on Facebook. Fabian, thank you for your call. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Uh, I just want to ask, is there a process for choosing a patron saint? And if you could suggest a, or if you could just suggest any way of reading the books you've written and Mr. Prasad, because uh, I'm trying to learn as much as I can, and I bought too many books. I have maybe like 20 <laughs> books, so I'm always like, I don't know the process of what the way I should go about this. All right. Okay, well, um, let's deal with the first question first. There is not any formal process for choosing a patron saint. Many people uh-huh. um, regard uh, any saint that you're named after as at least one of your patrons, just kind of automatically. So if there's a St. Fabian, then St. Fabian would be, or if there may be more than one St. Fabian, any St. Fabians that exist would be your patrons by default, according um, according to a common way of thinking about these things. Um, in addition, there, one can pick a patron saint, and there's not a formal process for that. You just find someone who's a saint, whose story speaks to you, and you can adopt that person as an additional patron. And you don't have to have just one. You can adopt different patrons. In fact, I have two as com- that I picked as, as uh, confirmation saints. So one can have more than one patron, and there's not a formal process for doing it. You just find somebody who speaks to you as a saint and then not literally speaks to you but you know someone whose story whose life story you resonate with and you want to imitate that person and their virtues and and turn to them and ask for their intercession and you just pick them in terms of your second question i'm not 100 percent sure i'm clear on it could you restate the second question again of course um the second question was uh 
if you could if you have any suggestions of how to read the more as far as educating yourself over the faith because I've bought maybe like three or three to six of yours for sure three of Mr. Broussard's and I've bought God knows how many because I also listened maybe a week ago and the woman that was on about her book because so, I found her talk okay. interesting so it was just uh, something over that what a, okay so what I generally recommend to folks who want to get a basic education in the faith is get a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and read the whole thing um, if that's a little much, then there's also a shorter work called the Compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a version for youth called UCAT. But basically, I'd get one of those works because they're a comprehensive survey of the faith written for different audiences. But kind of the base one is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. If you're looking for something shorter than that, then go with the Compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And if you're younger or just prefer something that's written for a younger audience, try UCAT and read the whole thing. Get an overview of the faith, and then from there, you can dig down into specific areas that are of interest to you. So you could dig down into my books or Carlo Broussard's books or whatever you choose, but reading that basic overview of the whole faith will give you a general understanding of the faith and will expose you to the different areas that you might want to learn more about in subsequent reading efforts. Uh, thank you, Fabian. Thank you for the call. I hope that was helpful to you. On we we're continuing in Texas. Lots of calls from Texas today. Alex is in San Antonio, Texas, listening on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Alex, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy Aiken. Yeah, my question was in regards to bringing up the guests. Uh, <clears throat> someone had asked a question in regards if you had to be married in holy matrimony in order to bring up the gifts or any form of state of grace in order to bring up the gifts uh, for the offertory. Uh, so what did they answer on that? Okay, I'm not aware of any uh, law that sets okay. out specific requirements for what one needs to do in order okay. to bring up the gifts at Mass. Um, in the main section of the Roman Missal, it just says that it's desirable that some of the faithful uh, bring up the oh. gifts, and that would mean someone who's a Catholic. Um, so right. as long as you're Catholic, you it would seem you can bring them up. However, um, I can see some variability in that. In the first uh -huh. place, I uh -huh. think that there, in the first place, I can see that, uh, I, I believe there are some situations where they may invite non-Catholics to bring up the gifts too, as a way of expressing, you know, unity with other Christians. So I can see an exception being made in that regard. I also can see an exception being made where even though someone is Catholic, they might conclude, you know, this person's situation is such that it would be better if they didn't bring up the gifts, because, for example, it could cause scandal. So if one is, say, not married in the church and or is, you know, living in living in a relationship that one should not be in, and that's publicly known in the parish, it could scandalize people, not in the sense of making them outraged, although it could do that, but in the sense of communicating the message that it's okay to be in a relationship that you shouldn't be in. And so ultimately it's going to be up to the discretion of the local pastor for who gets to bring up the gifts. Um, and he, uh, the pastor might make exceptions to allow, let's say you've got a Catholic spouse and a non-Catholic spouse, and they might both bring up the gifts, even though one of the spouses is not Catholic. On the other hand, you might have someone who's living in a relationship they shouldn't be in, and the pastor might say, you know, it would be better if we dealt with this relationship first, and then after that, you could bring up the gifts. Uh, and I'm going to say thanks and leave that there. I hope that that was helpful to you, Alex. Just uh, if lines just continue full. And we're finally leaving Texas. We're going to Connecticut. Chris is in Connecticut listening on the Catholic Answers Live app. Chris, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I was wondering what exactly is a species of sin, like the mortal uh, mortal sin, to be described in confession? Does it entail uh, if it was like a sin of negligence or omission, or if it was um, if it was a uh, sorry, if it was like what the degree of knowledge the person had, 
Uh, an example would be like if you somehow endangered somebody's safety, um, would you have to describe how that took place? Like if it was a omissive or you did something to risk their safety? That's just an example. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, okay, so when it says that we need to communicate the species of the sin we committed, what it means is the kind of sin that we committed. And that doesn't mean... Um, like, was it omission or commission? That's kind of built into the sin. Um, so you don't need to say, I committed a sin of omission. All you need to say, assuming everything is, is assuming there's nothing else affecting it, is I endangered someone's life. And leave it at that. You do not have to confess circumstances, like I had this level of knowledge, or this is why I did it, or anything like that. All you got to say is, I endangered someone's life. Now, if um, if you positively attacked somebody, like, let, well, there's, there's more to say, so I'll say it on the other side of the break. Hang on, Chris. Uh, the music is the signal, and that tells us we got to take this uh, break, so we'll be right back with more Ask Me Anything. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. Your calls are welcome. 888-318-7884. What was the church like in its infancy? In a word, Catholic. And Joe Heschmeyer has the receipts. In his best-selling book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church, he gives you the details from the historical records of the first two centuries of Christianity. Right now, get a copy for just $10, plus free shipping if you live in the continental United States. Get more information and order The Early Church Was the Catholic Church at theearlychurchwascatholic.com. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The same is true today. In the Holy Eucharist, we really meet Jesus. In the Eucharist is really Jesus, author Joe Heschmeyer explains how knowing Jesus in the Eucharist is the key to understanding all of Christian faith. Order your copy of the Eucharist is really Jesus today at shop.catholic.com or get it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Is the Catholic faith still a rock amidst the waves of history? Why does it so often seem to be a mess? In his latest book, Confusion in the Kingdom, best-selling author Trent Horn helps you to get to the roots of the present chaos, explaining the destabilizing movements within Catholicism and exposing the harm and scandal progressive Catholicism has caused. Order your copy of Confusion in the Kingdom today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore. Is Orthodoxy an alternative to the Catholic Church? In a time of uncertainty for many Catholics, Orthodoxy can look like greener pastures. Answering Orthodoxy, the new book from Catholic Answers Press, explains why Catholics who are thinking of leaving need to think twice. There are important reasons to remain in the Catholic Church and convincing answers to Orthodox claims. Order your copy of Answering Orthodoxy today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Matt Swaim here. Tomorrow on the Sunrise Morning Show, we'll talk about the importance of encouragement among believers with Gary Zimak, plus all the latest news, weather, sports, and more. Now back to Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken's our guest. He'll be one of the main speakers and one I'm looking forward to because Jimmy has uh, made so many uh, close studies of the Gospels, of the Scriptures in general, and I'd love to hear what he has to say about the parables, sermons, and conversations of Jesus Christ. And it's not just Jimmy. There's oh, lots. Dude, of... I'm, I'm not going to cover all that. Well, I <laughs> only got one talk. It's like 45 minutes long. Well, forget it. I'm not coming then. I was I, okay. Oh, well, then no, I that, guess we'll get a new MC. That's the general topic. Uh, uh, also there, along with Jimmy, Scott Hahn, Kimberly Hahn, Father Sebastian Walsh, Dr. Ray Garendi, uh, Dr. William Junker, all of our apologists. It is going to be great, September 26th through 29th. And if you sign up now in this month, if you sign up in the month of July, which has a few days left in it, uh, you will get $50 off any ticket that you buy. CatholicAnswersConference.com is the place to go to find out about it. Catholic Answers Conference. Conference.com. I don't know if I mentioned it, it's here in San Diego, and we'd love to see you here. 
Uh, back to the phones we go. Chris was on the, is on the line, and his question has to do with uh, confessing and how do you do it, and uh, what does it mean yeah. to confess the species? And Jimmy, you were in the midst of your answer. I was, and I want to, since I was trying to hopefully getting it done before the break and I wasn't able to, I'm going to expand a little bit on part of the answer I already gave, which is if like you, Chris gave the example of suppose you endangered someone's life. Well, all you technically need to say is I endangered someone's life, but that may prompt a question of how did you endanger someone's life? Because there are certain sins that the priest knows what you mean. You know, um, and uh, and you don't really have to specify. Like if you say I had impure thoughts, oh, the priest knows what that means. So you don't you usually have to specify any further. But if you say I endangered someone's life, well, how did you do that? I mean, it, so the priest might ask a follow up question on that, and you it's not required for the sacrament that you specify further because you've already said what you did but just to help the priest understand you should go ahead and answer on the other hand it, let's say you did something else let's say you committed assault and so you attacked a person physically well then all you technically need to say under ordinary circumstances is i committed assault and you don't need to talk about who you committed it against. You don't need to say why you committed it. You don't need to say whether you were drunk or sober at the time. You don't need to go any into any of those surrounding circumstances. All you need to say is I committed assault. Unless there is something about the situation that affects the species of sin. One of the things that will affect the species of assault is if you attacked the Pope. If let be, attacking the Pope is different than attacking a normal person, and similarly, if you because there's an element of sacrilege here, you're, it's not just an assault on another human being, you know, that's a, a sin of violence. It's violence against a sacred person. So if you committed assault against a, a the Pope or against a priest or a bishop or a nun or you know someone who's consecrated to god then that introduces an element of sacrilege into the assault and so i would say i assaulted a nun or i assaulted a priest or i assaulted the pope and by the way if you did assault the pope you're automatically excommunicated and it's reserved to the holy see so don't assault the pope and if you do assault the Pope, then prepared to have the be prepared to have the priest say, "I can't absolve you until I get word from the Vatican. We need to check with the Vatican to make sure that they lift this excommunication you're under." But um, that's a special case, and so the general rule is: all you need to do is say what you did, indicating the kind of sin in a way that the priest will understand it. You don't have to go into lots of detail. You don't have to explain the circumstances. You don't have to explain your own internal state. In fact, I generally urge people not to do that because a lot of people want to go in and confession and explain. It's kind of like here on Catholic Answers Live. When people call in with a question, they often want to give us a whole bunch of junk that's not related to the question. Like, here's the secret origin story of the question. You know, I was talking to my friend the other day, and we were having this discussion about the Bible, and my friend was pointing out that at one point in the Bible, there's this passage that sounds kind of strange, and we were wondering what it means. Could you tell us what Matthew 16, 18 means? Okay, the only part of that that's relevant is, could you tell me what Matthew 16, 18 means? In the same way, if you're confessing to a priest, all you need to do, say what you did, and if you know how many times you did it, and that's it. You don't need to give the secret backstory of what happened. Just what you did, and if you know, how many times you did it. Chris, uh, thank you uh, very much. I appreciate the call and the question. Lines totally full, so on we go to Boise, Idaho. Brian is listening on Salt and Light Radio. Brian, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hey, I wanted to ask, um, first in general, what does it mean for a church teaching to be essential? And then second, specifically, what um, factors encourage the church to formally define the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of Mary? That was called well, getting right to the question. I just want to get yeah. Brian. That's what Jimmy was yeah. talking about. Go, go ahead, Jimmy. So, so the... The Catholic Church does not use the categories of essential or non-essential 
when it comes to teaching. Where you encounter that tends to be in Protestant circles, where they have a division between some teachings that are regarded as essential and other teachings that are regarded as non-essential. And then there's a debate about, well, which go which teaching goes in which category. The Catholic Church does not use those categories. You will not find it in church documents talking about different kinds of teaching. Instead, the Catholic Church has a, has a, a different category structure. Now, one of the things it noted, one of the things it notes, is that some teachings are more central to what's called the hierarchy of truths than others. Like, for example, uh, the existence of God and the triune nature of God, and the incarnation of Christ, those are all very central to the Christian faith. Whereas, something like the existence of angels, or, you know, the exact matter that you need to use in baptism, those are not as central to the Christian faith as the existence of God, the triune nature of God, or the incarnation of Christ. Those are more peripheral. Well, um, so what determines what we need to believe? Like, do we need to believe in the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption? Well, yeah, we do, but the reason is not because they're central, it's because they're true. And that's the fundamental thing that the Church asks when it's looking at requiring a teaching, is, is this true or not? And so uh, there are a lot of things that are just theological opinion where you can make up your own mind. But if the Church has determined that something is true, that's when it becomes official Church teaching. And that and there are different grades of Church teaching all the way up to infallible. And in the case of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption, the Church concluded that they're true, and so we need to believe them, just like we need to believe in the existence of angels. Not because angels are central to the Christian faith, but just because it's true that angels exist. Um, In the same way, and this isn't exactly a teaching of the Church, although it could be one day, you know, Andrew is the brother of Peter. Well, okay, that's not very central to the Christian faith, but it's true. It's what Scripture says. Andrew's the brother of Peter in some recognized first-century meaning of the term brother. And so, hypothetically, the Church could one day say, you know what, guys, it's true, Andrew's the brother of Peter, so you need to believe that. And it could even infallibly define that, because it's true. Well, the fundamental reason that the Church um, declared the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption infallibly is because it concluded they're true, and so we need to believe those things. Now, in terms of why did particular popes, and this is Pius IX and Pius XII, why did they choose to infallibly define these truths, that's something you'd have to ask them, and frankly, you can also read the documents in which they did it, um, because they explain the reasons why they're choosing to make this decision at this time. So you can follow up by reading the documents to get a sense of what they were thinking, but the fundamental reason is they're true, so we need to believe it. Brian, uh, again, uh, lines are full, so I'm going to keep going. I hope that that was helpful to you. Thank you very much for the call. Don is in Lowell, Michigan, uh, watching on YouTube. Don, welcome. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Jimmy. Thanks for taking my call. Jimmy, on your YouTube channel a couple of months ago, you posted a video, um, which I really enjoyed, about um, debunking skeptics, why Joseph went to Bethlehem. But Mm -hmm. in watching that, it raised a question. In light of Luke 2, where it said there was no room for them at the end, and therefore Jesus was born in the manger, why didn't they just go to Joseph's house? Well, they probably did. Um, The translation, which we have in the King James and some other translations, that there's no room at the end, is a lousy Mm -hmm. translation. Um, the The term that's used there in Greek is kataluma. And kataluma means dwelling place or lodging place, somewhere that people live. Living space is another way you could translate it. It does not specifically mean a a travel lodge for or a lodge for travelers, which is what we think of as an inn or a motel or a hotel. That's a special kind of living place for travelers. And that is not what is meant by Cataluma. In fact, in Luke's own gospel, Later on, when they have the upper, the, they have the uh, the Passover at the Last Supper. 
and mm-hmm. Jesus sends Peter and John to go into Jerusalem and, and go to the house where they're going to have it. He says, when you talk to the householder, ask, where is the Cataluma where I and my disciples can eat the Passover? So it referred to the upper room in the house where they had the, uh, where they had the Last Supper. And that's basically the meaning here. If you study the, and I I mean to do a video on this too, but basically, if you study the structure of Israelite houses, they typically had an upper room, which is where the people lived. They had a lower part of the house, which is where they kept the animals. And then they had the top of the house where people would hang out and enjoy the breeze and look at the stars and stuff like that. So when, um, when, when it says that there was no room for Joseph and Mary in the Cataluma, all it means is the living space in the house was full up, presumably because of all the relatives that had come in to be registered for the census. And so it's not really great to be given birth in a place where you're just jam-packed with people. So Mary chose to give birth in the lower part of the house where the animals were because the Cataluma or the upper room was already full. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the call, Don. Uh, we better take a break. Uh, we'll be right back with more Ask Me Anything with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Hang on. Catholic Answers Live will return in a moment. In Morse code, the sequence SOS is a distress call. It's been said that it stands for Save Our Souls. Well, right now our world is in big trouble, and we're putting out an SOS call for help. Will you answer that call? St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, has hundreds of teams who share the good news with souls who don't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to get involved. Hi, this is Father Mike Schmitz. Please join me for Ascension's Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year here on EWTN Radio. We're going through the entire Bible and the Catechism in 365 days. If you've ever wanted to understand what it means to be Catholic and allow those truths to shape your life, this is for you. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz, tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. Welcome back. Catholic Answers Live. Enjoying an afternoon of conversation with Jimmy Aiken. Uh, You get to ask whatever question you want, so you can still get in on the conversation. Well, we'll try to get you in. I can't promise you anything, but if you dial now, we'll do our best. 888-318-7884. Ask me anything really means ask me anything uh, when Jimmy is here. Uh, Let's see where we're going. We're going to New York City. New York City. Matthew, listening to EWTN on Channel 130. Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Matthew, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Yeah, I like to, uh, to um, as Catholics, um, spouse uh, with with your husband and wife. Um, we know that the gift of uh, bonding is that uh, procreation. We have to be op- open to life and procreation. Um, just a discussion we just had between you know, Catholics among men, couples, whatever. Uh, is it uh, is it okay to bond and enjoy the gift uh, of your, you know, the sexual gift that God gave you uh, without having 20 kids? And if you have five or three or four okay. or five or six, do you have to be open to life every time you're, you're uh, engaged in the bonding okay. uh, all right, Matthew. Okay, Okay. so the definition of marriage is that it is a partnership of the whole of life directed towards the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. So because it's directed to the good of spouses, the good of the spouses, it's okay to enjoy marital relations and not plan on having a kid at that very moment. In fact, God built human reproduction differently than he built uh, it in in other species. In some species, um, the uh, the partners are only sexually receptive when they're fertile, and so if they have if they have relations during the time where they're receptive, they're they're very likely to have have offspring. But that's not the way it works in humans. God designed human females so that they are sexually receptive um, even when they're not fertile, and He designed human males 
so that they're fertile all the time and they're sexually receptive all the time. So most of the time when you have marital relations, you're not going to be getting pregnant because the woman is not fertile. And that's okay. That's by God's design. One of the things that the that having marital relations when you are not fertile does is it helps bond the spouses. So it's part of the good of the spouses. Now, having said that, we cannot thwart the purposes for marriage. So it would be wrong to say, hey, let's get married, but then let's thwart that purpose of being good for each other. Let's let's have one of us completely dominate so that that person gets all the benefit and the other person gets none of the benefit. Okay, that would be wrong. And in the same way, it would be wrong to say, let's get married and we'll keep all the good for ourselves, but we're not going to do the generous thing and be open to life. We're, we're just going to be selfish as as the husband and wife and keep all the good for ourselves and we're not going to we're not going to be open to life when we have marital relations that also would be wrong now that doesn't mean that you need to try to have a kid every time and it also doesn't mean that you need to be a providentialist and say oh we'll just have marital relations whenever and if we have a kid a kid comes and you know no there are situations where the church recognizes this is not a good time for us to have a child perhaps because of a medical condition or a financial condition or a psychological condition or you've already got a bunch and you can't reasonably take on any more. In that case, the church understands that um, that that you need to regulate having births so that you don't have a child in an inappropriate circumstance, but um, you need to do it in a way that respects God's design for marriage. So, for example, using natural family planning, which is a way of detecting when the woman is fertile and just abstaining for those times during the month, which in, for most women, that's not very many days. And then you can continue to have marital relations outside of those days, just, just like the way God designed it, because he designed us to have marital relations even when the woman is not fertile. That's okay, but what you can't do is thwart this purpose of marriage by, say, sterilizing yourself or your spouse or using barriers or using chemicals or things like that. You need to work with God's design for human reproduction rather than thwarting it and replacing it with something else. And Matthew, thank you very much. I do hope that that was uh, helpful to you. Uh, we're going to Detroit, Michigan now. Dylan is watching on YouTube. Dylan, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. All right, uh, Jimmy, thank you. I was an atheist for seven years. You played a, your apologetics played a big part in um, my conversion. So thank you oh, for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. It's my honor to have played a role. Yeah, I start uh, OCIA in September. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. um, so my question was, I have a past, and am I obligated to confess sins when I was really intoxicated. Okay. Are you already baptized? Yes, but not in the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, assuming it was a normal Christian baptism, then you would need to confess sins between the time of your baptism and the time you were received into, into the Catholic Church. Any sins you committed before baptism, you do not need to confess. Um, when it comes to sins that you committed, if you say you were really intoxicated, then um, we have to distinguish between two different types of intoxication. St. Thomas Aquinas refers to them as perfect intoxication and imperfect intoxication. Perfect intoxication is intoxication where you are so drunk or high that you've lost your moral faculties and you're willing to do immoral stuff. Imperfect intoxication is anything less than that, where, you know, you've got a buzz, but you still have your moral faculties. You're not going out and doing immoral things. Well, um, if, you know, you said really drunk, so I assume that refers to perfect intoxication. If you did something while you were perfectly intoxicated and you did not plan to do it, 
before you got intoxicated, then you don't need to confess it. So, you know, if if something happened while you were drunk and, you know, perfectly and you didn't plan that, you don't got to confess it. What you do need to confess is I got so drunk that I lost my moral faculties. Um, but you don't need to confess what happened after that. On the other hand, if you planned to do it, then you do need to confess it. So, like, if it, let's say you... Um, Let's say you went out drunk driving and you planned to drive drunk before you got drunk. You need to say, I committed drunk driving. Um, if worse than that, you got drunk so that you would commit the sin that you otherwise normally wouldn't have done. Like, let's say, and I'm not saying this is you, Dylan, I'm just using it as an example. But let's say you normally would not go to a prostitute. But you got drunk so that you could go to a prostitute, then you'd need to confess both. You'd need to say, I got drunk so that I w would go to a prostitute. And so um, there, there are several different categories here. If you didn't plan to do it, then all you need to confess is the drunkenness. If you, if you did plan to do it, then you need to confess the drunkenness and what you did. And if you got drunk in order to do it, then you need to say you got drunk in order to do it. So those are the three basic categories. They all apply to perfect drunkenness. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I was waiting for... I didn't for... even know what happened. So could you say it again, Dylan? I put you on hold by accident. No, you're good. Um, that oh. clears it up perfectly. I was so intoxicated, I didn't even know what happened until after. Okay. If you... If you didn't know it happened until after and you didn't plan to do it, you do not need to confess it. Uh, Dylan, Thank you. Uh, you said Jimmy was an important part of your uh, coming to the faith. If there's a, a, a Jimmy Aiken book that we can send you that you would like, just uh, tell uh, Edgar and we'll send it off to you. Uh, if you yeah. don't, if, if you don't, what was that, Jimmy? I said, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. If you don't know uh, the books, uh, maybe a Daily Defense. Uh, well, or he's, he's got, well, there's a lot of them. Edgar will help you with that. Edison in, in New York watching on YouTube. Edison, we'd like to get you an answer, but you'll have to be kind of quick with your question. That's not going to work. Edison, <laughs> are you there? No? All right, we'll go to Danny in Iowa. Danny, you're going to have to be quick if you'd like an answer. Will do. Uh so we, we know and we understand the general concept of angels and how they're separate entities and not humans in a previous life. We understand that there's fallen angels and guardian angels and that we're all assigned a guardian angel. We were wondering if our guardian angel is capable of being a fallen angel or being assigned as a fallen angel or capable of becoming one, if that makes any sense. Okay, so there are several questions there, uh, all about guardian angels. I, first thing I'll do is recommend an upcoming episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World for you, where I talk all about guardian angels. It's episode 325. It's, it's not coming out immediately, but it'll be coming out pretty soon. So watch for episode 325. Um, in terms of would God assign us a fallen angel as a guardian, I can't 100% rule out the probability, but it seems like the answer is going to be no. Um, guardian an fallen angels are not interested in guardian humans. They're interested in harm in humans. Now, could God, by his omnipotence, force a an evil angel to do good? Yeah, he could, but I don't have any basis for saying he's going to do that. In terms of your other question, could an angel that is currently good and our guardian fall? Well, there's a debate about that. Common theological opinion is no, that uh, the angels had their choice between good and evil in the first moment of their existence, and whichever way they picked, it stuck. But there is some, and that's a, an opinion you'll find, for example, in St. Thomas Aquinas, but there are passages in the Bible and in other early Jewish literature that suggests it may be more complex than that, and maybe angels can fall later. However, if your guardian angel fell, God would replace it and make sure you got adequate protection. He, the one guarantee is God will make sure we are properly guarded. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for the, uh, the call and the question, Danny. Episode 325, look for it. It's coming up, and it'll answer uh, many, many of your guardian angel questions. Uh, Jimmy Aiken, uh, you did us a solid. Thanks for coming in this hour and helping us out. Yeah, my pleasure. And that will do it for us. Uh, we'll do it again tomorrow. So uh, come on back. I, I, I think we got to almost everybody, but there's one caller we didn't. Maybe call back tomorrow. In any case, we'll be here, and we'll see you then, God willing, right here on Catholic Answers Live. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.